Welcome to another episode of the New Normal TV. My name is Marco de Barros, pastor of New Life South Coast, located right here in New Bedford, Massachusetts. So excited to be sharing God's word with you, starting a brand new series called Untangling Jesus from Religion. You know, Jesus never intended to start a religion. He came to give us understanding of how to have a relationship and an experience with God. And today we're gonna to begin to untangle some of the stuff that gets in the way of that by looking at what it means to actually follow Jesus and not just religion. So, check it out. If you brought your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. We're going to begin this series titled, Untangling Jesus from Religion. And I got to say, it is a, it's an uphill battle because of all the mess that religion has created around Jesus, that it's going to take some doing. So I need to let you know this morning that this series is going to take some brain power. So I need you to tune in because there's a lot to untangle. There's a lot to undo. So I hope that you are ready to go on a journey for this next few weeks. I really believe that what's going to happen is, I really believe this, you're going to see Jesus as irresistible. You're going to see Jesus as really the one that you want to be in relationship with. And you want to see Jesus in a brand new light. I really believe it. I believe Jesus is so irresistible, you don't have to be religious to know him. And I believe Jesus is so irresistible that even if you're religious, you want to know Jesus. I really believe this with all my heart. I'm so excited to share this with you, but it's going to take some doing. So tell your neighbor, please don't distract me. I'm easily distracted. If you get up and go to the bathroom, you distract me. Don't be that guy in the middle of the sermon. Excuse me, excuse me. You know, hold it together for a few more. Can you say amen? amen. Mark chapter 2, beginning with verse 23. Are you there? The Bible says one Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Jesus said to them, haven't you ever read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God during the days when Abiathar was high priest, and he broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priest allowed to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Can you say amen? amen. You know, Untangling stuff is frustrating, isn't it? You ever been in a situation where you're trying to untangle a rope or a cord or, or you're trying to undo a mess? It's, it's frustrating, right? I asked my wife permission to show you this, but this is how our basement looks right now, okay? Just go ahead and show them the picture of our basement. That's what it looks like when you have 10 kids. And it doesn't matter if we clean it five minutes before. Five minutes later, it looks like a hurricane went through your house and, and wreaked havoc on everything. And my wife is one of those, like, well-put-together people. She can't stand messes. So I'll be downstairs playing with the kids. She comes down, she looks, and she just goes right back upstairs. <laughs> She's like, I can't do it. I just can't do it. And here I am in the middle of all this watching the Patriots game, like, this is awesome. <laughs> but messes could be overwhelming. Right? Sometimes you have to tackle something. You're like, man, I don't know where to begin. And this is how I feel about religion. That's how I feel about this series. There's so much mess that sometimes you don't even feel like you want to tackle it because you're like, where to begin? And every time you try to tackle it, you end up getting into a fight with somebody. You end up arguing over it instead of having some resolution. It ends up being a fight. 
And now you unblock, you're blocking people on Facebook <laughs> because you guys can't have a conversation about it. And then the worst part is, is when people just give up and say, forget it. But my friends, today I, I really believe this. We don't have to throw Jesus out with the bathwater. I think we can do some work here and really get to the heart of some things that I think is going to actually set you free. It's going to liberate you. It's going to help you understand that there is Jesus and then there's religion. Right? And though, even though we put Christianity in the same category as a religion, Jesus never intended to start a religion. Jesus came to give us something much deeper and much more meaningful than religion. Can you say amen? I truly believe he is irresistible. And our passion here is to be a church that's helping people truly connect with Jesus. And not just go to church. I, I know some churches are great uh, helping church people. But really our heart is for the unchurch. Our heart is to, is to tell the world, look, listen, everything that you're looking for is found in Jesus. Yeah. You know, I'm telling you, I really believe it with all my heart. Everybody's looking for hope. Everybody's looking for healing. Everybody's looking for purpose and meaning. Everybody's looking for understanding. I, I think it all translates into Jesus. I, I really do. I think if we can really entangle some stuff, I think more people are going to say yes to Jesus. I think more people want to follow Jesus. It's just that religion has gotten in the way for them. They can't see right from wrong anymore because we've tangled up this thing. But I think if you can untangle some stuff, I think some of your friends are going to come to Jesus. Some of your loved ones are going to come. And I think if you've been to church a long time, you are going to have a new pep to your step. I think you're going to be excited about Jesus because religion has stifled you and, and, and has made you this sour saint. You ever meet sour saints? Nothing worse than a sour usher. Sit over here. <laughs> Thank God we don't have sour saints here. Our ushers are awesome. I love our ushers. They're amazing. Our ushers don't do this. They do this. <laughs> like, they, they're into it. They love it. You know. But we really want to help the world connect with Jesus. That's why he came. He came. He said, go into all the world. Preach the gospel. We need to go beyond the four walls of the church and bring the gospel, the good news of Jesus to a dying world, to a hurting world who is looking for hope. Can you say amen? amen. But today, my friends, you know, we, we're going to untangle some things and it's going to take some time. So it's a crock pot type of message. I hope you can, you can tune in because we're going to go somewhere. I really believe this. We're going to go somewhere today if you just stick with it. So to give you a little bit of context here, when Jesus came to earth about 2,000 years ago, religion was already a thing. Religion was not new. Okay, people already believed in God and gods. You know, you had the Jewish people who believed in one God. You had the Romans who believed in many gods. You have the Greek mythology with the different perspectives on God. So this wasn't new. So Jesus didn't bring religion. Religion was already there when Jesus came to earth as a human being. So when we get to this place, when you see Jesus walking in the streets and talking to people, people were already laced in religion. The Jewish people, for example, um, lived by the commandments of the Old Testament, the, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. They truly believed that's how you live your life. And they would call the Old Testament the way, the truth, and the life for them. And so when Jesus comes, this is not revelation for them. This is just part of their lives. It was ingrained in them to, to, to seek to follow these commandments. Now with time, because they received the Ten Commandments back in Egypt when they were slaves and God said, hey, listen, now that you're free, I'm going to give you Ten Commandments to live by. Which a better word for commandment, by the way, is principles. It doesn't translate well in English, but the original, God's saying, I'm going to give you some principles to live your life by. Principles that's going to help you, that's going to bless you, that's going to contribute to not just you, but the well-being of others. So, so think about this, right? God says, hey, I love you guys. I just set you free from slavery. So live by these principles, and you will have a blessed life. You will live a great life. Can you imagine if our society just lived by these principles? How different things would be? If we just say, let's just stick to these principles and see what happens, right? But then as time progressed, they begin to kind of drift away from these principles and begin to do things they shouldn't do. And, and so in, in attempt to try to bring people back to those principles, 
they begin to add extra loss to it because they were like, well, you are kind of like borderline, kind of not killing, but let's add some other things so you make sure you really don't do anything to those weird things. So when Jesus comes on the scene, they've added so many laws that by now there's about 650 laws attached to the Ten Commandments. Not about you guys, but when y'all hear 650 laws, I'm already exhausted. Like, how do you know you're keeping every single one of them? Right? Like, is there like a, like a 650 law manual that I can walk around with? Be like, yo, what's 613? Like, I don't, I'm not sure if, if I'm hitting it. Right? And again, the, 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 the drive was to really do the law. That was the drive. So the Pharisees were the main denomination of Jesus' time, okay? Denomination is like being Catholic or Baptist, you know, Pentecostal. We are non-denominational, which is also another denomination. <laughs> you see how weird this thing gets? So they were the main denomination that, that took the law seriously. It took the Bible, the Old Testament seriously and was trying to help people live it. And they were strict by it. They were like, man, this is how you honor God is by keeping all these laws. So when we get to this place, Jesus is walking around with his disciples. And it happened to be a Sabbath day, which is Saturday or day of rest. In the Jewish calendar, sundown to sunup is a day. So Friday night to so Saturday night is basically the rest day, the, re the day that you just rest. Because again, what's the heart behind rest is that, hey, you're a human being, you're not a human doing, so learn to rest, learn to understand where your sources come from, where your resources come from, which is God, right? So the heart of this thing is good. But the problem is, by the time Jesus comes on the scene, just around the day of Sabbath, they've created 39 different laws. It was no longer just about rest, it was about yeah, but here's how you actually rest. So by the time you're done with resting, you're actually stressed because you're like, did I keep all these laws? Are you tracking with me so far? So Jesus is walking around with his disciples on a Sabbath day. They get hungry. The disciples were like, yo, there's some grain right here. Let's pick it off and eat. Well, the Pharisees saw this and threw a flag on the plate and said, that's a penalty. You can't do that on a Sabbath day. That's work. It's amazing, right, how human nature is. Always looking to point to what's wrong. Which, my friends, you have to understand this, the heart of the principle is good, but when the principle does not have a heartbeat attached to it, it becomes more of a burden, an obligation, than the actual principle itself. Are you tracking with me? So far, in, this, in the purest form, the Sabbath is good. You should rest. That's a good thing. But when it becomes about how you rest versus resting, are, are, you, are you tracking with me? So listen, they felt compelled to impose these sub-laws upon sub-laws upon people, but they missed the heartbeat of the principle. This is where religion gets interesting. It's when you start doing things that are supposed to bless you, but they end up hindering you. Here's the bottom line what Jesus was trying to get to, and then we need to untangle from all these laws and regulations. Here's the bottom line. Let me, let me put it this way for you. Look, see, every commandment or principle, better word is principle, has a heartbeat attached to it. If it does not bring life to people, then it's just legalism. If all it is is to make you walk the straight line, but it doesn't lead to life, then all it is is a law that is empty from the principle itself. So Jesus was trying to get to the heart, not just of the Sabbath, he's trying to get to the heart of the law. What is the purpose of the law? And how is it supposed to lead you to life and not make you feel like I can never measure up? Matter of fact, the law tells you you can't measure up. That's why you need life. Legalism is what they were doing. They took the 10 commandments, the 10 principles, they added 650 plus laws to it. Let me, let me summarize legalism to you. It's excessive adherence to law or formula. Legalism is more concerned with the fact that they broke the law, but they're not concerned with the fact that you just got fed. Which behind every principle of God is people. 
Did you notice when we told the Ten Commandments, did you notice how God did it? God says, hey, you, you want to love me with all your heart, my soul, and strength? Well, the first four is about loving me. And if you want to love your neighbors, you love yourself, well, that's how you love your neighbor. You don't hurt your neighbor. You don't kill your neighbor. You don't steal your neighbor. You don't cover your neighbor. Like, in other words, the bottom line is, it's not even the principle. It's the people attached to the principle that I'm trying to get to when it comes to this. supposed to be about, about obligation. It was supposed to be about relationship. There's a monk that lived in the fourth century, amazing thinker, one of the probably greatest thinkers of all time, Augustine. If you get a chance, read some Augustine. But Augustine struggled with religion for a long time because he felt like he couldn't measure up. He couldn't do it. And Augustine had to come face to face with grace and surrender himself truly to the grace of God and begin an actual relationship with God. He had to surrender his religiosity. He had to surrender his guilt. He had to surrender all of that stuff. And then when he finally understood grace, he said these words. It's so powerful. It's going to mess with you. I hope it messes with you for the rest of this week. But look what Augustine says. He said, look at this, look at this, look at this. Love God and do what you will. Now let that sink in for a second. Love God, do whatever you want. Is it registering yet? You mean do whatever I want? Yeah. If you love God. What do you mean? There's no way. Like, there's some things I shouldn't do. Well, you love God? Then do whatever you want. Because if you truly love God, you're not going to violate his principles. (laughs) 
There is so much freedom in this one little sentence. That when you have questions like, is this a sin? Well, do you love God? If you do, then do what you got to do. Well, pastor, how far is too far? You love God? How, how do I know if this is the person I'm supposed to? Do you love God? Pastor, what about society and everything? Do you love God? And do what you got to do. Because if you truly love God, you also got to love people. Therefore, your love is displayed by what you do. So it's not necessarily that you say you love God, it's what you do that actually says that you love God. <laughs> oh my God. So, it, it's not that you say, I am married, is what you do that says you're married. Can you imagine again talking to your friend who is married and he goes, it's so hard to be faithful to her. Hmm. You love her? Because if you do, you do whatever you got to do. Oh, my God. This is so liberating. Because I don't have to feel like, I don't have to feel like I'm in love with my wife. I made a commitment to her. Love is not a feeling. It's a commitment. You know how liberating this is? When people start trying to bring, yeah, but why don't, you don't do it, you don't, you love God? Yeah, but yeah, people say, oh man, yeah, I, you know, I would love to serve, but you know, the way that, that, that my schedule set up, I mean, I could probably do it like every other month, but the fifth Sunday of the month. <laughs> and you go, do what you gotta do. But let's not call it that you love God. Let's call it religion. Let's call it what it is. Let's call a spade a spade. Because somehow, 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 magically, somehow on Tuesday night when your favorite show comes on at 8 o'clock, it's always free. Somehow, every Sunday, 1 o'clock from 1 to 3, oh my goodness, I am free. What makes us who we are is what we love. That's what defines us. And we don't know we love something until we do something. Or don't do something. Oh my God, this, this is so freeing. If we, can, if we can get here. See, Jesus was trying to tell them, guys, you're missing the point. The principles were supposed to bless you. Not burden you. And now you're worried, which ones am I breaking? Which one did I not break? And so that's how people know God, unfortunately. You talk to them, they're like, yeah, I was, I'm a good person. How do you know? Well, I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't do that. Well, but are you alive? Are you excited about God? Do you talk to him? Do you have revelations from him? Does he reveal himself to you? Do you guys go to work together? Do you guys go to, to the yoga together? Do you, like, enjoy, like, that relationship? Is it enjoyable to you? Because what you love reflects it's easy to understand when you ask someone, do you love God? And they say, yeah, I go to church. That's equivalent to say, do you love your wife? Yeah, I go home. <laughs> you love your kids? Yeah, I pay child support. What we say reveals our hearts. Like what, the way you talk about something, man. You ever see someone who's passionate about something? It could be anything. It could be food. You ever, some people make you want to eat something. 
the way they break down the ingredients, right? You ever watch that guy, Guy Fieri on, on, man, that guy, every time, like, I want to eat something. That guy, it doesn't matter what he eats. Mmm. I'm telling you what, man, there's an explosion in my mouth of all the flavors <laughs> happening. When you love food, you do what you gotta do, Guy Fieri. Do you ever talk to people who truly love God and you walk away feeling like, my God, I just want to love God like you do. Yeah. Like you really, truly, genuinely love God. One of my good friends, Stephen Mook, he's a pastor, he's been here. That guy loves Jesus. Yeah. Oh, he loves, like, I told him the other day, I said, bro, man, you, you make me want to love Jesus more. He'll call me and leave me like the longest voicemails. <laughs> Like, like, he will leave me like four or five minutes prayers on my voicemail. He won't even say hi. He'll go, Father God, I just want to thank you. And I sit there and I go, man, this guy loves Jesus. And I want to love Jesus like that. Like, it's not a burden. It's not an obligation. It's actually the greatest privilege in life so powerful to know that it comes down to relationship. If you love God, you do whatever you want. Because if you truly love God, then you're not gonna violate His principles. Just like when you love someone, you wanna do certain things and you avoid doing certain things. That's what this is all about. Jesus said, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbors, yourself. That's it, that's the whole thing. That's Christianity in a nutshell. And it all starts with you inviting Jesus into your life loves you, he cares about you, he came to show you how to live and to die for your sins so you can have life in him. So take a moment, invite Jesus into your life just by praying, Lord, today I want to accept you as my Lord and my Savior, forgive me my sins. I pray you untangle some of this religious stuff and help me have a relationship with you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you pray that prayer, you, we believe that you become a new person. The old is gone, the new has come, and you need a place to continue to work on your relationship with God. That's what church is all about. And we love to host you in person. You and your family are welcome to come. We have kids' classes for all ages, uplifting music, and always a practical message from the Bible. We would love to hear from you. Listen, if this program is helping you in your walk with the Lord, and it's helping you grow in your understanding of who Jesus is, we want to hear from you. We want to hear your testimony or your feedback about what God's doing in your life through this TV program. So email us at newnormal at newlifesouthcoast.com. Let us know. Also, if you have a prayer request, we'd love to pray for you. So let us know in that email, because for us, it's about helping you get closer to Jesus. So until next time, may God bless you mightily.